You're listening to the STEM XM podcast, highlighting women in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And now, your host, Mel the Engineer. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the STEM XM podcast. I've got a panel of guests lined up for you today, and there's a lot going on that's coming up here pretty quickly, so you may want to grab pen and paper for this one. Engineers Week is coming up in February, along with Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day. These events are facilitated by the Discover E organization, which you can find at discovere.org. That's with the letter E for engineering. And one of our panelists today is the SR, the director of Discover E. In addition to those great events for young students, there's also a special film about engineering that premieres on February 19th. It's called Dream Big Engineering Our World. You can learn more about that at dreambigfilm.com. And our other two guests on the show today are two women engineers featured in that film. First, we have Avery Bang. She is a trained geotechnical engineer and now serves as the executive director of Bridges to Prosperity. She has design, program development, and construction experience in nearly a dozen countries. You can learn more about her organization at bridgestoprosperity.org. Uh, then we have Menzer Pelavan. She is also a geo- geotechnical engineer, and she specializes in earthquake engineering. Menzer was inspired to build more resilient communities and reduce the risk associated with earthquakes following the 1999 uh, Coachelli earthquake in Turkey, which she experienced as a young girl. She currently works as a geotechnical engineer on critical infrastructure projects. So let's jump right in with this panel of amazing women. Uh, Thea Sar from Discovery Organization, Menzer Pelavan, and Avery Bang. So uh, let's do some quick intros and kind of introduce yourself, and we'll just go around the horn. So Thea, you could go first, and, and then Menzer, and then Avery. Sure. Hi. Thanks for having me, Mel. Um, my name is Thea, and I have the distinction of being the only person on this call who is not an engineer. Um, and but I have dedicated my professional career um, to helping uh, young people uh, understand and learn about engineering um, through many programs that Discovery offers. And that's my story. This is Menzer. Um, I'm originally from Turkey. I am a geotechnical engineer um, specialized in earthquake engineering. That's what gets me excited. And I'm currently working as a geotechnical engineer in Seattle, Washington with CH2M. Hey guys, um, no, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, my name is Avery Bang, and I am also a civil engineer, geotechnical engineer by graduate school training. Um, <laughs> and I work with a nonprofit organization called Bridges to Prosperity. And we focus on designing and building pedestrian long span footbridges for communities that are isolated all around the world. I'm originally from Iowa. Um, I've been living in Colorado for the last decade, and I'm currently on a sabbatical living in the UK, uh, going back to school in Oxford. Oh, awesome. That's great. Okay, so we've got some really amazing women with us today, and we, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, So we're here today to talk about some of the very exciting events that are coming up that Discovery puts on, and uh, we're also going to talk about a film that's going to be released this February called Dream Big, Engineering Our World. Uh, So let's start first with, with the Discovery type of stuff. Thea, could you tell us about what's upcoming in February for Discovery? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, Discovery is an organization that works with universities and volunteer engineers and engineering societies and companies all across the world um, to uh, hold events, local events, where kids, families, teachers, students, anyone with an interest can come and do hands-on engineering um, and learn about engineers and meet engineers. Um, Most Students around the world um, don't ever meet an engineer in their day-to-day life. They meet 
police people and they meet uh, fire people and teachers and doctors and lawyers, but rarely do they meet engineers or technicians. So we do a couple of events. Um, one is called Engineers Week, and it's been happening since 1952. Um, so it's been around for a little while. And this year, Engineers Week is uh, starts on February 19th um, and goes through its uh, Sunday to Saturday. Um, and uh, there will be events at museums, and there will be events at um, labs and parties and celebrations um, uh, at universities and uh, places all over the country. And on our website, discover e with the letter e dot org, you can go to upcoming events and see if there's an event near you. And we also run a day called Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, and that is on uh, February 23rd. That's the Thursday of Engineers Week. And um, events designed specifically to get girls interested um, uh, are happening all over the country. So, for example, in Austin, the University of Texas in Austin hosts a day, and they bring in a couple girls. About 8,000 girls go to their campus on that Saturday of Engineers Week and do hands-on activities. And in Chicago, uh, uh, Argonne National Lab invites um, girls in. And again, you can go to discovere.org and find um, an event near you. That's very cool. Well, there are a couple. Yeah, so the the Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day or, or Engineers Week, you mentioned this event at, at UT Austin, and that one's like a really big one, but some of them are smaller, right? Some of them are just like at a local school. Exactly. Some of them are local schools. Some of them are Girl Scout troops um, inviting in a, a, an engineer that the, the leader might know. Um, it can be any size. It can be, uh, you know, you uh, as a young girl, as a young person just coming to the Discover e site and, you know, looking at what engineering careers are all about. Um, it could be having a conversation with a, with a student, um, uh, you know, uh, in middle school or elementary school and just saying, hey, here, have you heard of engineers? I'm an engineer. What, um, or I work with engineers. That's what I have to say. Um, let me tell you about this really cool uh, field and all of the amazing things that they do and how, um, like Avery and Menzer, how they are making a difference and making our world a better place through their work. And I think that's what most, uh, not only students, but most adults don't know, um, just how many things engineers do uh, to make all of our lives easy, better, healthier, um, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, all that great stuff. Right, absolutely. So Thea and Menzer, maybe could you speak for a moment about if you've been involved with any of these Discover E events, or even could you speak to us maybe about an experience that you had when you were younger that sparked your interest in, in science and engineering and maybe helped you go down the path that you're on? Um, I will start with events that I've been involved in and then continue with what sparked my interest. Um, I'm actually a graduate of UT Austin, and um, I'm so proud that we are hosting this big um, Introduce a Girl to Engineering event. That was that when I was a graduate student, we would have the family day where all university opens their doors to the public, and um, as engineers, we would uh, organize some small programs to show like what we actually do or like how in our case how the soil behaves, what your technical engineers, what the earthquake engineers do. And you see how their perception of engineering change when they actually meet an engineer. I'm talking about the kids. And then when they start interacting with 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 an engineer. I think one to one story to me happened that happened when we were actually filming the Dream Big uh, event, and um, I was with a bunch of kids, and one of them came to me and said, like, are you sure you're an engineer and not an actress? I don't think engineers look like you. I said, yeah, I'm an engineer with a graduate degree, even I practice as an engineer. I like being an engineer. And what Tia mentioned and what you mentioned, Mel, is, like, very correct that it is important to bring some activities to them, but it's very important for uh, giving opportunity to the kids, especially K-12, to 
need some of the engineers to see and understand what we do and how we change the world. And I think these programs really help um, kids uh, with to to start thinking about the STEM education and for the girls especially to think about, start thinking about the STEM education. For me, the spark was, um, actually for me, it was kind of the reverse thing. I grew up in Turkey, as I mentioned, and um, especially engineering is more male dominated than it was more male dominated then uh, compared to probably to the United States with the understanding that the, it should be only done by men. And I was, we were in the high school, it's right about before the university entrance exams. And the one of, in one of the classes, the teacher was asking, so what are you going to be? And all these guys, it's a very common thing, they want to be civil engineers. And I said, I'm going to be a civil engineer too. And this I mean, he loves me. The, he, the teacher did not mean anything bad, but the first thing that he said is, Mr. come on, you cannot be a civil engineer. Look at you. You're a girl. Well, guess what? I am the only person who ends up being a civil engineer out of that group. <laughs> um, but it is, it is that kind of perception that we have in the society and these type of events and outreach, outreach that we can do as engineers would help to overcome that perception that the society has and also to explain what we do and why it is important to them and how we change actually their lives, everyday lives, uh, with the things that we build or we construct or we design. Okay, so what about you, Avery? I think it's such a, an interesting question, though. Um, you know, where do we come across those moments in life where we realize um, – the thing we most want to do might be right in front of us. And, and um, maybe a little bit like men's are, there is a bit of uh, people telling you you can't do it. There's a motivation in that. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, I, and, I, and I, I had a similar experience, actually. I feel like my father is a civil engineer. Uh, in fact, he's, he's designed some bridges in my hometown. And so we grew up really looking at public work projects with an eye of awe and admiration and curiosity. Um, but it didn't really occur to me uh, that that was something that I really wanted to do, something kind of heroic uh, until later. And I feel like, you know, the foundation had been laid, um, but there was, a, there was a bit of it where there were lots of young, young men in my high school class being like, oh, I want to do engineering and uh, kind of thinking about, well, I, I think I could, I could do that too. And it was just a much less, common career track or aspiration, I feel like, for a young woman, um, even in, you know, in, in a place where, you know, education ostensibly is, is very fair. And I think for me, I, I, I entered the University of Iowa uh, on, a, on a soccer scholarship, and I entered engineering school, but I, I would have definitely considered myself uh, an athlete first and something that was passionate about my team and, and winning and, um, you know, with interested in school, but maybe a little bit less so in the beginning. And I took an opportunity to study abroad and I got on a plane and I do what I think every 20 something should do. And it's to get a one-way plane ticket and figure out if you really should come back. And I went to Fiji and spent a semester um, living and working in areas that had a very different outlook than my um, experience growing up in the, in the middle of the United States. And it really opened my eyes to what fairly simple public infrastructure work could do for people. And it, and it came full circle for me now, honestly. Like I had seen my, my whole life what engineering could do. And I saw my father be uh, successful in building many of the things that I now um, design and build myself. But it wasn't until I was able to come full circle and to see that my work in a very tangible way could impact the lives of others where I really put those two pieces together and said, I have a, a, a um, inkling and a, and a capability with math and science and I, and I am good at it. But at the same time, if I want to help society uh, to be an engineer is quite, quite frankly, the number one and best way to do that. And so I came back from Fiji and I had a newfound passion for, for this work and for finding a career that could really change the lives of people around the world. And that's how I um, got involved with Bridges to Prosperity. And I don't regret it for a minute. I think engineering was absolutely the most foundational and important move that I've made 
um, to date. So, okay, let's kind of deviate for for just a moment and and talk for a second about your specialty areas. So, uh, Avery and and Minzer, you're both geotechnical engineers. So, uh, Avery, maybe you could tell us. You know, give us a one sentence uh, kind of summary of what your specialty is. Um, I know, I know that you do a lot of work with bridges. So if it's that, maybe you could kind of explain that to us in the context context of geotechnical engineering. And then Menzer, maybe you could tell us about your um, your earthquake specialty. Sure. Um, so I wrote my master's thesis on soil structure interaction for low income. Uh, low access areas. So the idea that with a geotechnical um, engineering lens, you often rely heavily on the testing equipment and access to the ability to get in and understand what soil or rock is beneath you. And in many rural areas around the world, the availability of um, some of the more expensive and also heavy and cumbersome equipment is quite frankly well beyond the scope of what is practical to get into a place where you can only walk. And quite frankly, you're walking for many hours. So I, I did my master's thesis on looking at a, an ability to design uh, bridge abutments and bridge uh, anchorages, uh, making some simplifying assumptions with most conservative geotechnical uh, parameters, doing kind of a parametric analysis around possible combinations. Very cool. And Menzer? Uh, my specialty is earthquake, geotechnical earthquake engineering. My master's thesis was on a phenomenon called liquefaction, when during the earthquake, uh, these uh, clean sand uh, granular deposits, in the, if the water is present when, they, when the ground starts shaking, can start acting like a liquid. So the soil that you were relying on to take the um, load from the structure will start behaving like a liquid and it will lose all its strength. So then you would see uh, the tilted buildings or the sunk buildings, some other um, soil features that we commonly see after liquefaction. The liquefaction was one of the main um, reasons of the devastation that we experienced in Turkey after magnitude 7.6 1999 earthquake. And uh, when in the geotechnical engineering class, when I heard about it, I wanted to study it. Geotechnical engineering, earth, geotechnical earthquake engineering is still a very young field, and each earthquake teaches us, uh, teaches us a new lesson that we know about, that we need to learn about the soil, because as Avery said, the soil conditions are, it's mother nature. It changes from one, it can change in like 100 meters or 100 feet, and it can be like drastically different, at which I get to choose some of the projects that I worked on, I get to see. So uh, that kind of struck my attention, and I wanted to work on the liquefaction phenomena that got me into geotechnical earthquake engineering. Then I did my... PhD in the University of Texas at Austin, and in the areas we are developing these uh, seismic hazard curves as the, uh, we proceed into the design in a more probabilistic manner to uh, predict the likely ground motion that will hit one particular area. But there are so many uncertainties that are coming into equation. And one, one of the biggest uncertainty is what the soil conditions are. And my PhD study was trying to account for these uncertainty that we have in a par particular project site to integrate it in the probabilistic assessment of what would be the ground motion that we should expect at that uh, particular project site. To design for the to be able to design the structure to satisfy, depending on the design of the structure, of course, to at least satisfy the life safety criteria. Okay, and both okay. of <laughs> you, Avery and and Menzer, have been featured in the film that I mentioned called uh, "Dream Big: Engineering Our World." Uh, can you tell us how? did that come about? Uh, who approached you and, and how did you end up involved with 
the film and uh, what's the film's main point? What are they trying to get across through it? I'm happy to jump in. Um, but to my experience with the Dream Big film, it spanned almost three years. Um, and I had the distinct privilege of having someone amazing at American Society of Civil Engineers, who I'm actually not sure who, um, put my name out there when Barbara and Greg McGilvery were looking for uh, engineers just to kind of talk with and to discover what maybe some of the stories of folks around the world could be and who those faces might look like. And I, and I think I had like an initial call, didn't really think much of it. You kind of get a lot of random inquiries, um, particularly in the, in the, in the public sphere of uh, nonprofit engineering, uh, like Bridges to Prosperity. And um, one thing led to another and ended up going out to their studio and uh, talked about a number of possible ways to tell the story of amazing engineers and we brainstormed together. The potential narrative of being able to tell the story of how bridges are saving lives and about how people in their own home countries, whether it's in Haiti or whether it's in Nicaragua or in, in Rwanda, engineers in those countries are the ones designing and, and building these bridges for the, for the communities out in the rural areas. Um, so I actually kind of thought that I would be a facilitator of uh, telling that story from behind the scenes of getting the story told of young girls going to school for the first time and, you know, pregnant women going to the doctor and, and hopefully highlighting the role of the local engineers in that effort. Um, and I, I spent a little bit of time with the film crew. They spent about 12 days in Haiti at a very, very rural place. Uh, with some amazing people on the Bridges Prosperity team. And I, I came for a couple of days, but I didn't really expect to be a main part of um, the narrative. And, and I think I actually don't even know how much you'll see of me in the film or not. I haven't seen the final cut, but it's been a fun process the whole way through. And I think the whole story is meant to tell not only the Bridges Prosperity, obviously, uh, but the story of how engineers are changing lives and designing and building uh, the structures that the rest of the population uh, really rely on, not only in Haiti, but right here at home as well. Unlike Avery, in this case, my my addition, addition to the film was very recent. In fact, it was only May. Um, I do not know who in the ASC suggested uh, McLeary Films to contact me, but one day I received this um, voicemail. I was in a meeting. I, I got the voicemail after the meeting, and it was saying that we're doing some film and like we would like to talk to you about it. I initially thought it was spam. I mean, who would contact me for a film? So then I get to talk with uh, Shane McLeary. They told me that they were interested in my story. I was um, featured as one of the new faces of engineering for 2016, and as, as a part of it, you tell you're basically your story in five minutes and you record a video. They get to see that video and uh, they were interested in the story and they wanted to make it to the part of the film, but it was like already late in the portion because uh, the film was about to come out. And uh, uh, supposed to be half hour call turned into an hour and a half call. Uh, they're wonderful people and I feel so privileged to get to be able to work with them and know them. And they're very um, sensitive about how to tell the stories and how to make it, make the film more impactful in a way that it will attract uh, kids, but also it will give them the this idea that you too can make it because it is telling the personal stories. I was able to see some uh, it was not the final cut, but some portions of the movie, and it still it seriously gives you the goosebumps because it does not only talk about the how amazing the structures is, how these people who are who were just like them ended up becoming engineers, helping different societies in different ways, and making what they probably once thought impossible possible, and that is the biggest message I think the movie itself is giving. So after, uh, and I'm very honored to be a part of it. So after talking about my story, they wanted, they said they wanted to include it 
within the movie, what I thought was they will just include the story. I did not really think that I was going to be in the movie, but it ended up that way. And I'm, I feel really uh, very privileged to be a part of this project because it is not just a movie, but it is a, it's bigger than just a movie. It's a huge program that they're putting together with all the outreach events that are being planned. Right. And I think it's it's such a good tool to showcase, um, you know, the different things that that you can accomplish with engineering and also, um, you know, to showcase the way that we can impact the world and and, and do good for society. Um, so, Thea, maybe you could talk to us about the involvement of discovery and um, how discovery is uh, promoting and kind of using the film um, to help with to help with your own organization's initiatives. Yeah, no, it's um, it's fabulous. And listening to Avery and Menzer's stories of how they got involved and and um, became engineers and the work that you're all doing is so inspiring. Um, and Avery, I couldn't agree more that I think that everyone should get that uh, one way plane ticket. Um, and see the world and see what our role is in the world. I think that's amazing advice to, um, to anybody at any age. Um, but so for uh, Discovery got involved because the film premieres during Engineers Week, and it'll be premiering at 50 um, uh, museums, science museums and commercial theaters around the U.S. and internationally. Um, and you can go to discovery.org slash dream big and find a museum uh, near you where you can go see the film and it, it, it will premiere, um, it will open at those theaters starting around February 19th. So the very first thing people should do is go see Avery and Menzer in the film. I've seen them both. And like Menzer said, it, did, it gives you goosebumps and sometimes it even makes you cry. Um, so the film is a wonderful jumping off point uh, for people who are interested in having more kids uh, learn about engineering. And as Menzer said, there's a huge outreach component, and Discover E has uh, signed on to be one of the outreach partners. And our job is to take volunteers, uh, volunteer engineers, um, who want to uh, work with young kids and, and work with kids in general um, at museums and in after schools and classrooms and do hands-on engineering activities and use that movie as a place to start and say, hey, what did you know um, about engineering? What did you see in that film that surprised you? Uh, and then there's a whole, uh, there's 52 different activities on our website um, that are taken from topics in the movie that parents can do with kids or kids can do on their own or museums can do in their outreach efforts. Um, so we really want people to go see the film, talk about um, the amazing work that Avery and Menzer are doing, talk about the amazing work that engineers are doing, and say, um, you know, I want to know more. And if you want to know more, there's all kinds of wonderful places you can go to to learn more, not the least of which is talk to an engineer, um, look up what, you know, what engineers do, um, and uh, just find all those great opportunities to engage in engineering. And that's what Discover E is all about. It's matching volunteers um, with kids, with teachers, with parents, with after schools, with museums, um, to give folks who haven't had an opportunity uh, to learn about engineering, to explore it and see what it's all about. That's excellent. That leads me right to my next question. So Discover E has some... Uh, great resources that are freely available on the website at discover e with the letter e.org and I'll put that in the the show notes as well as a link to the movie um, but suppose that there's a student or a teacher listening to this and and they'd like to do something for engineers week or introduce a girl to engineering day and, and it's not happening at their school how could they make it happen or on the flip side of that, if there's an engineer listening and they'd like to jump in and get involved and maybe host something like this in their own community, what do they need to do? Sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'll start with the teacher or the parent listening or the student listening. 
Um, if you're a student and you're listening, first thing to do is go talk to your parents or your teacher and say, hey, you know, can we uh, see if we can bring an engineer into our classroom or into our after school and have them talk to us, uh, have her talk to us about what she does. Um, and if a parent or an a educator is listening and they're like, I'd love to get someone to come into my classroom, there's a couple of easy ways to do that. First is to call your local university with an engineering school. Uh, a lot of them have uh, engineering undergrads who love going out into classrooms and talking to kids, and they have programs to do that. Or if there's a local engineering company in your in your in your town, um, here where I live, I uh, my little town of only thirty thousand people has three um, engineering firms. So I can call up any of them and just say, "Hey, would you send uh, engineer into?" Uh, into the classroom and a lot of times they're like yes we'd love to and they bring the activities and they'll say what are you doing in your classroom and what might you like me to concentrate on um, so uh, teachers and um, but if you're unsuccessful or if you don't want to make that call or you don't have time to make that call and that happens to a lot to all of us um, if you go to the cool content and activity uh, portion of our website you'll see those 52 hands-on dream big activities but there's also 80 other um, engineering activities. So there's over 100, uh, I'm going to do my math wrong, there's over 130 activities on that website um, that you can filter for, um, for forces and energy or sound or um, uh, green. Uh, so whatever part of your curriculum you're working on, you can look and see what uh, activities might fit in the time period you have available. Um, if you're a student and you want to know more about engineering, go to the Discover Engineering section of our website. There's uh, nine different resources there from just a very basic description of what an engineer does um, to different uh, descriptions of all the various fields. You know, what is a geotechnical engineer? What is a, a mechanical engineer? What is a nuclear engineer? All of that is there and, and then also some tips on how you start exploring engineering. And then finally, if you're a volunteer, if you're an engineer or a technician out there and you want to get more involved, the first place to start is to um, go to your human resources uh, division um, or your corporate citizenship division of your, of, your, um, of your company and say, do we have any relationships with schools? Are there schools? Are there, is there a program we have where we're sending people out um, into classrooms or after schools or partnering with local museums? Um, many of our partners um, do that already, and so you don't, as an uh, individual volunteer, you don't have to do that, that, that work. Um, there's usually someone on staff doing that for you. If you work at a smaller organization, um, uh, you might have to do that yourself, but that's easy enough. Um, uh, the teachers out there, I actually had an engineer last year who worked at JPL, and she was like, oh, I don't know if the schools want, you know, they'll think I'm weird if I call. I'm like, what project do you work on? She said, well, we're designing uh, habitats for humans when they go to Mars. <laughs> I said, don't you worry. You tell a teacher you want to come in and talk to his students or her students about all of the ins and outs of developing habitats for people on Mars. They will open you with They'll welcome you with open arms. And most of you have, most engineers have really cool jobs out there that people don't even know exist and um, they want to know more about. Uh, so, and it, and it often links in with what uh, the teachers are trying to um, uh, share with students. So um, it's really just uh, what the best piece of advice my mother ever gave me. is: Your job is to ask and it's their job to say no uh, or say yes. But if you don't ask, um, they won't come. So teachers, uh, call up those engineering colleges and, and firms and ask them to send someone. And engineers, call up those schools and say, I'd like to come in. And nine times out of ten, the answer is going to be yes. Can you come tomorrow? And the tenth time, it's going to be how about next week? Yep, absolutely. That's And that was a great example. For our listeners who may not know, I just wanted to add that uh, JPL stands for Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is uh, NASA's a uh, little outfit over in Pasadena, California, and they do lots of cool stuff there. And and I think you're right. You know, some of the jobs that people have, they they don't realize how cool it is, and that you know other other people just don't have a line of sight to it. And so when you come in and talk about this, you know, this really neat engineering or science 
work that you do, it's amazing and inspiring, especially to young students. I know. I just listened to what, you know, Avery, what you did in, in, in you know, Bridges to Prosperity and building these bridges and, in, in, you know, help uh, bringing this to uh, countries. And I know they do the, the vast majority of the design and the work, but, you know, working with them, partnering with them, that is just so inspiring. And men's are the, you know, the earthquake stuff you do. I, I listen to you all and I'm like, oh, man, should have studied engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And then I'll add one more thing to that, that I, I think sometimes uh, for teachers or other academic administrators, it might be intimidating to try and approach um, a company on your own, or maybe you don't know what kind of company to contact with a certain type of engineer. And we'd love to help you with that. I know that um, Thea and other people at Discovery would love to help you connect with uh, you know, s the specialty area that you're looking for. And, and certainly if I can help you, you can reach out directly to me too. And I can uh, help point you in the right direction, either for a company or an organization that can help you get to where you need to go. So there's, there's some really big engineering organizations. Uh, ASCE has been mentioned, which is the American Society of Civil Engineers. There's also IEEE, which is uh, electronics and electrical engineers, and ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And there's going to be, you know, either staff or volunteers at these organizations that can help you, uh, you know, establish something, whether you want to do something for Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day or for Engineers Week. So don't be shy. We, we would love to help. <laughs> Yeah, and just yeah, to piggyback I'm... what you said, if you go to our website and look at uh, the About Us page, you'll see a list of over 100 different organizations um, with links to their websites. And all of those organizations are committed to sending um, volunteers into the classrooms or after schools. So that's a great place to start. Yeah, and in addition to what Mel was saying, most, most of these organizations have local chapters and most of the cities or like that covers a bigger region and these organizations can easily put you in contact with these local chapters where you can reach the local engineers that can actually um, hopefully can come up to the school rather than you or like meet you meet in at like the science museum and they're they're working really closely to uh, identify those volunteers yep Absolutely. Um, so I want to ask some more specific questions uh, to you, Avery and Menzer, about about your own career paths and specialty areas. So uh, Menzer, maybe we could start with you. Can you explain for us in, in really simple terms that, that maybe a young student could understand, uh, how, how did you get your specialty to design structures that can withstand earthquakes, and, and what does that involve? Well, it started with education, uh, definitely. Um, after completing my bachelor's degree in civil engineering, I wanted to specialize in earthquake engineering and earthquake-resistant design. And I picked the geotechnical engineering, and you can do earthquake engineering for the structural design or geotechnical design. But earthquake being in the earth, <laughs> it starts with the geotechnical. And what we geotechnical engineers do is the first step, we try to identify what the soil conditions are in a project site. So let's say we are building a hospital, we go to the project site we identify what is underneath the ground because that plays a very important role in what type of accelerations or the movement that structure may face. So we need to identify that. The next thing, once we know what soil conditions we have, we start uh, predicting what motions we would expect in that region. So for example, if you're in Seattle, you might expect a magnitude 7.4 earthquake, 
but if you are in the east coast that you would expect uh, probably um, magnitude 5 earthquake and the soil behaves differently for different magnitude earthquakes and as geotechnical engineers we try to come up with what is the most likely scenario for that project site once we decide on that Looking at the soil conditions, now we say, yes, this is what's going to happen in the rock. But as those motions come from the rock to the surface, they're going to change. They're going to get higher or lower. And we need to take into account for that. That is the next step that we do. Once we are done with that, we go and say, okay, uh, this is what the structure will, real, uh, will feel but I need to see if there are any other hazards in the area, if there is a slope that can become, um, that, that, that can lose its stability during an earthquake because of the shaking. Or is there like a deposit that, uh, with the water in it that can liquefy, that will cause this building to suffer some additional damage. That's what we do. And once we uh, check all the hazards that are, that might be applicable to the site, we come up with the design parameters and provide them to the structural engineers so that they can uh, make some computer models of their structure to ensure that, depending on the how important the structure is, if it's a residential building, let's say, that it will satisfy the life safety criteria, which does not mean that it won't get damaged it might be damaged, but it will at least provide people inside the building to escape outside, and it will stay, stand up still after the earthquake to uh, provide a safe road for evacuation of the uh, building. That is probably, hopefully, in the simple terms, as much as I can do. That's what we do as geotechnical earthquake engineers with my specialty. Right, right. That's fantastic. Right. You're listening to episode 16 of the STEM XM podcast. Today we're speaking with two geotechnical engineers, Menzer and Avery, along with Thea Saar, the director of Discover E Organization. For specialty areas within geotechnical engineering or even other related engineering fields that students might be interested in learning about. One that comes to mind for me is is coastal engineering. I wonder if, if that's sort of related to, to um, geotechnical work and, and building, you know, piers and whatnot out into the water that can Absolutely. withstand wave action and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, so civil engineering has many different um, branches within it and all of the branches work together. So um, for a peer, for example, coming from your um, example, the coastal engineer takes into account uh, uh, the phase and how that, like the, the force that will come from that and the uh, location of like where the peer is located, then the structural engineer will uh, will come into place that is basically would be responsible about of the structural integrity um, of the peers. Then the geotechnical engineer is the person who would tell that, okay, you need to uh, provide this type of foundation so that this structure will carry this load. So um, there are many different branches in civil engineering that one can pick to pursue. And we all work in together when the final structure comes becomes a reality. For that for that to become a reality, to be able to build the structure, we need to all work together depending on where the structure is located mainly. So there are uh, there is coastal engineering, there is um, uh, hydraulic engineering, and uh, that mostly relates to uh, for example, like if you're designing a dam and like you need to produce the energy, how would you produce the energy? What would be the most efficient, uh, most efficient way to do that? That the hydraulic engineers would help with that. 
and um, then the structural engineer will be satisfying like how what type of rebar and concrete strength should be used to build that structure. Geotechnical engineer will provide the type of like geotechnical design parameters for the foundations and so that the structure will the or the founding soil will be able to carry the load that will be coming from the structure. So it's a whole uh, many different branches of engineering actually working together. And when it, when a building is coming, become, if it's just a building, it's not just the civil engineers, then you need to work with the mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. So we all work together to uh, prepare the end product. It is not just one type of engineering. And there are many different engineering car carriers one might want to follow. The other portion of the um, civil engineering is also environmental engineering. As geotechnical engineers, we work very closely with them. If you're really um, interested in the contamination or like some, I've seen some um, girls like really interested in environment and they want to do something about the environment. And that's what one thing that you can do. You can become an environmental engineer and um, start working in that. They help us in the contaminated areas so that when we are building around that, we make sure that we don't spread the contamination and um, how to mitigate those sites. So there are many, many, many different options that you can become and probably I did not even cover like half of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. There's many options and there is a lot of overlap. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And um, like you said, there is certainly a lot of overlap in the, the civil and environmental world. But I, I like to highlight too that um, even beyond that, there is there's a lot of environmental work that chemical engineers and mechanical engineers do. I mean, if, if you're passionate about um, power generation or, you know, moving us into the future with, with power resources, then certainly you can go into uh, some of these other fields, mechanical or chemical, and, you know, a chemical engineer might work on, um, you know, solar panels and a mechanical engineer might work on, you know, uh, thermodynamics at a, at a power plant or something like that. So there's, there's lots of options and it's definitely worth investigating the different specialty areas that, that are out there within, within engineering. So thank you for bringing that up and, and explaining that, uh, to us. So, uh, no, this is Avery. May, yeah. I, may I jump in for a second? Yeah, please do. I, and I've got some questions sure. specific for you too. No, I, I would just really love to encourage, especially the student listeners, not to get overwhelmed. And I think that there is more in the fear of engineering than any one possible person could understand or digest. And that's coming from someone with um, a lot of years thinking about engineering. And I, I think what's maybe as important is to think about what is engineering at its most principal level. And I, I believe it's really looking at the challenges and the big problems in the world and not only looking at identifying the problems but having the skills and utility and agency to find solutions and if the young people out there could realize that it's not about being a chemical engineer or a civil engineer or understanding how to be a nuclear engineer but really i want to be a problem solver and i want to help people and then distilling from there how specifically your skills and interests line up, I think that that is a really great approach. And, and I don't mean to trump the importance of eventually knowing what it is you want to do. Um, but I think that we as a, in an industry could do a lot better job of making it approachable. And I think keeping it general sometimes and understanding that we are the 1% of the population that designs and builds all of the services to the other 99%, whether it's your cell phone or your cell tower. Um, you know, and everything in between. I think that that is the important uh, piece of what we do. Absolutely, that's. I a, absolutely agree with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great way to summarize kind of what engineering is all about. So, a Avery, from your perspective, um, could you tell us a little bit more about a after after you found this passion 
and you decided to come back from Fiji and you found this area that you wanted to go into at school. Um, what what made you decide on civil engineering and specifically, and then what took you into this work with, with bridges? And then just for my own curiosity, is there overlap between uh, your organization and other nonprofit organizations like Engineers Without Borders and things like that? Sorry, that was a lot All of questions. questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm like right now wishing I had taken better notes. Um, so I might have to ask you for repeats. But I, I came back from Fiji, and I really, um, at the time, I was actually studying mechanical engineering, and I was a double degree student in studio art, and I was really enjoying kind of the idea of everything from metallurgy and being able to take a metalworking and jewelry studio art class. At the same time, I was taking a chemistry class. Um, it really brought it all together for me. And in, in the beginning, I really kind of envisioned myself more interested in maybe building and designing cameras, which is kind of bizarrely different than bridges, but not. And so a mechanical engineering approach would be um, perhaps a little bit more in line. And when I was in Fiji, I realized that for me, part of the beauty of it is to be able to have my hands wrap around whatever it was that I was going to design. And so there is a bit of in the studio art world, I was in a ceramics class and you can actually build quite literally a pot. And there was something really satisfying to me about that, that I didn't want to lose. And for me, civil engineering is the opportunity to not only um, design something, but to also go out into the field and to see it get built. And I think that that's certainly not for everyone. And I don't think that people who are not interested in being out in the environment should then say, oh, I shouldn't do engineering. <laughs> um, because even within civil engineering, there's many, many, many people that never go outside into the field. Um, but that was something that drove me. And I felt like to be into the environment, to understand what it was I was designing um, and understand how to build that and how to design that better and to have an iterative process was a huge priority. And so for me, that was a, a good reason enough to switch to civil engineering when I got back to the University of Iowa. And um, I actually got involved in my first bridge project with Bridges to Prosperity uh, as an undergraduate. And they were an existing organization and I called up the founder and was like, hi, I'm, I'm Avery. <laughs> I'm in Iowa and I am 20 years old. And I think you should let me build the bridge. And I remember um, the founder, Ken France, I think the shock at like, wait, who is this? What are you? And, um, you know, the, the full story is, of course, there's not just me, but five amazing students that had all come together with the idea that we could build something for our school project that would be more than just a piece of paper and a design report. And um, between the five of us, we had quite a bit of gumption and dedication and certainly perseverance. And we ended up building a bridge in Peru, which really transformed my life. Um, I think the idea of giving back through engineering was something, but to come back and eventually actually do that was transformative. Um, so I ended up uh, applying for graduate school with the idea that uh, I was more interested in how the bridges could be standardized and how could you take a bridge design and make it somewhat similar that you design and build in Peru to what you could theoretically build in Haiti. And I thought the best way to really be able to standardize um, would be to look at the soil uh, structure component, the geotechnical aspect. And um, obviously that's been talked about in much more detail before, but the structural engineering was important, but perhaps that came down the line. And the most important thing for me was to first understand the, the geotechnical soil structure interaction. So I did my graduate uh, research in that area and joined the organization Bridges to Prosperity um, out of graduate school. And we have partnered with engineering organizations all over the world. Um, we've IUDA and Axion to um, a number of different engineers, sub-borders organizations, Australia, the UK, US, Canada, um, organizations in country, Puente de la Esperanza and Mano a Mano. But everywhere we work, we really try to target the best and brightest, most local organizations that have engineering capacity that want to partner with us and want to build a better world in, in partnership. So we are partnering with folks all over the world. And if anyone is listening and wants to partner with Bridges to Prosperity, we are 
always on the hunt for good partners. So definitely let us know. Excellent. Okay. And I'll, I'll put uh, a link to Bridges to Prosperity in the show notes as well, of course. And um, any other, you know, kind of information you want me to include, I'll, I'll put in there. Um, okay, so we're about out of time for our panel discussion today, but it, it this has been fantastic to have all of you on, and we want to encourage everybody again to go see the movie Dream Big. It's prob- If you're in a metropolitan area, it's probably going to be at a museum or an IMAX near you. So... Um, Final thoughts, uh, Menzer and Avery, do you have any kind of final advice that you might want to give to students that are interested in engineering? I, yep, this is Avery. Um, I think if, if there are students interested in engineering, you can do it. I feel like there is no one type of engineer, and that's what makes this industry and this career so amazing. And I know engineers that actually didn't even like math coming into it. So the stereotype of the pocket protector, uh, middle-aged white man with balding hair is not the entire industry. (laughs) So, um, you know, that that is indicative of a lot of us and a lot of our people that we need and want and uh, are driving this industry to solve the world's biggest problems. And we need you to be part of that. So jump in. It's fun. Well, same with Avery. It's just, if you want to do it, if you want to, if you're a problem solver, if you want to solve problems, if you want to, some, I, I believe engineering is in one way changing the world, be a part of it. You can do it. And it is, it starts with you believing in that you can do it. You are not less compatible than any of us. You have everything that you need. It just needs to maybe a little bit of work. And as Avery mentioned, you don't need to be amazing in maths or physics. There are so many different ways that you can be involved and be a part and be an engineer. Um, so I think Dream Big and all the programs that are coming to the theaters is a great opportunity for all the students and all the younger generation to at least just to go there and explore what is in for them. And it's like maybe that's something that they never even thought about uh, that they're interested can just strike their attention. I really encourage them to go there. And but more than more importantly, whatever they want to be, they just it all starts in with just believing in themselves. And they because they can do it. They're they have everything and anything to be able to successful in this field. Absolutely, I think I think. That was great advice from both of you, and I couldn't agree more. If you're listening to this, you've got it in you to pursue whatever path it is that you're interested in, uh, including engineering. So definitely jump in. And then I just want to open it up for any last words from Thea about uh, discovery and and getting involved with these events coming up in February, uh, Engineers Week and Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day. I just want to say that um, what I love about my job is I get to meet such amazing people like Mel and Avery and Menzer, who all are new faces of engineering in the Discovery Program, and and um, you guys are am- amazing <coughs> representatives of the field. So, and to uh, to say that if you're an educator, if you're a student, if you're an engineer, be curious. Go find out more about engineering and find out more about how you can engage the next generation. Great last words. Well, thank you so much, ladies, Thea, Avery, and Menzer for joining us today on STEM XM. I really appreciate it. And everybody go out and see the movie Dream Big. Once again, I'll put links to that in the show notes. And yeah, I'd also love to see any pictures you've got of being involved with Engineers Week or Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day. So thank you again, ladies. Thank you for the opportunity, Mel. Thanks, Mel. Have a good one, guys. Okay, ciao. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 16 of STEM XM. What an enlightening panel of women. Be sure to check out the film Dream Big, Engineering Our World. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. 
And also, if you'd like to be involved in activities for Engineers Week or Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, be sure to check out the resources on Discovery's website. There may be an event going on near you that you can volunteer for or that you can attend. Uh, and you can also find resources for getting something going at your own local school or museum there. So I put links to Discovery um, as well as some of the organizations we mentioned where you can potentially get connected to engineers to bring into your classroom. So those are all in the show notes. Once again, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Avery, Menzer, and Thea for joining us today to share the tremendous information on the film as well as Discovery's activities. You can find this episode's show notes at stemxm.com slash episode 16. That's stemxm.com forward slash episode and then the number 16. Thank you again for listening and I look forward to speaking with you again in the next episode. See you in 17. This has been an episode of the STEM XM podcast. Thank you for listening. We would really love if you could pop over to iTunes and give us an honest, positive rating. It helps more listeners find us to learn about STEM careers. Thanks again, cheers, and we'll catch you on the next episode.